thank you uh, everyone for for joining us um, for the webinar and um, i am with missy um, who is uh, one of our patients in our treatment facility in, in guadalajara mexico um, the purpose was to basically speak to um, um, everyone again and um, talk about missy's uh, um, story uh, we would like to um, discuss uh, her condition briefly, um, her journey, and uh, uh, we will also uh, we will be happy to take uh, questions regarding regarding uh, uh, regarding her treatment from from a patient perspective. Uh, thank you very much, Missy, for joining us. Uh, we are we are glad, um, and um, um, okay, I think I need to um, yeah okay sorry. Um, and uh, so uh, I, if you allow me, Macy, I would like to introduce your uh, medical condition briefly. Um, um, so uh, as uh, uh, so Macy is a, 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 a spinal cord injury patient who uh, suffered spinal cord injury, injury in February uh, last year. Um, and uh, um, she had a C5, C6 quadriplegic spinal cord injury, which, which, which is resulting in uh, incomplete quadriplegia, uh, a certain level of weakness in her um, uh, upper body, but complete loss of uh, uh, motor function and sensory function in the lower limbs. Uh, uh, in addition, Macy is also suffering from autonomic disc reflexia, which is uh, an unfortunate uh, side effect uh, um, of uh, cervical and upper thoracic spinal cord injuries. Uh, uh, this is causing um, fluctuations in the blood pressure level, sometimes sweating, sometimes uh, um, some cardiovascular issues. Um, so um, I think uh, uh, we will appreciate, Macy, if you can also share your story a little bit. Um, um, uh, I think we can start again from from little bit uh, um, introduction to your, your injury from, from your point of view, what happened exactly and what were the steps uh, involved after, you know? Okay, so in February of 2020, I had a car accident. Um, involving me and my children. Uh, they are fine, mm -hmm. but I was paralyzed on impact uh, from the chest down. Um, I was in the hospital for approximately five, five and a half months, rehabbing and recovering. Um, upon my leaving, which would have been approximately June 17th of 2020, um, I went home to do in-home rehab and then um, thereafter, I did outpatient rehab. What I learned in that process is that um, there wasn't a lot out there for people like me to recover, at least in my area. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, come upon uh, these new nerve transfers with a doctor based out of Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. Justin Brown, fantastic doctor. Um, from that point, I was able to get some of my arm function back and some of my hand function back. That is still in process. Um, throughout that process, I came upon your facility, uh, Verita Neuro, uh, fantastic facility. Um, you guys were putting some information out there uh, via Instagram, Facebook, and, and other um, media outlets. And I decided to reach out and see what it was all about. I do know that in the United States, um, it's not being offered in the way that it's being offered in other places in the world. Uh, currently, to my knowledge, it's Bangkok or Guadalajara it are the only two places that you can go to get the epidural stimulation of the spine and the rehab. And should you decide to do stem cells, also an option. Um, I reached out to you guys, I want to say maybe a month or two before I came here, which would have been June 14th. And I've been here for approximately 30 days and we're seeing great progress. I took my first step July the 1st. My AD is much better. Um, my blood pressure is already higher. I'm actually getting hot at night instead of cold, which is extremely weird because I'm always cold. Um, but there's a lot more that I can say. I, I just kind of want to leave it up to, you know, you guys and what questions you have, because when I was first going through this process, 
I had no one to answer these questions for me. And it was a very scary thing to just jump right in. So uh, part of the reason I've been sharing so much with you on Instagram is I really wanted to give you a transparent view of what this process actually looks like from the patient's perspective, not just from the doctor's perspective. Thank you, Missy, for a very nice introduction. Uh, I also want to introduce myself. I think if they have medical questions, so I'm a part of the medical team um, at Veritas Neuro and uh, uh, I am partly responsible for medical evaluation and for putting together part of the treatment plan because uh, uh, as you also know, it's quite a comprehensive uh, plan. Uh, it, we are looking at various aspects of uh, uh, a patient's recovery, patient's journey. So if there are any medical questions, please uh, feel free to direct uh, towards me. Uh, but I think the focus will uh, remain on Macy, uh, hearing Macy's story. Uh, also, um, I think uh, um, um, I also wanted to um, discuss a little bit more about your MRI scan, Macy, just for patients, because I think many patients, they ask, what does the MRI scan look like before the, uh, before the injury, whether it was a complete injury or incomplete injury? Um, so if you, uh, if you don't mind, I can briefly talk. Uh, it was a, a very classical, uh, classical findings on the MRI scan. Um, it is called cystic myelomalacia, which means that the spinal cord is replaced with more like cystic tissue, uh, which happens after a few months after the injury. So this is what is the normal finding with you after classical tra traumatic uh, um, spinal cord injury. So in your case, it was similar, although it's quite uh, uh, slightly more extensive widespread as compared to a classical spinal cord injury patient. So it was, uh, I think from C5 to around T1, which is spanning around the three to four segments of the spinal cord. Uh, but uh, uh, Clinically, uh, anatomically, it was not a complete transaction, uh, which is the case in most of the patients. Uh, I, I think around 99% of the patients, they don't have clinical complete cut of the spinal cord. But uh, uh, functionally, um, it was a complete injury. Um, and um, um, so, uh, Messi, I think uh, uh, we can talk, uh, if you don't mind, uh, about your... Uh, um, surgery, I think the first exposure, how did the first few days go? Because I, I believe that's the most important part. That's what excites patients. That, that, that's what makes everyone nervous at the same time. Yeah, well, I could definitely understand that. I actually don't get nervous about the after the surgery. It's always mm -hmm. before the surgery when I want to have a panic attack. Um, but I've had so many in the past year that I'm, I'm trying to get there. Uh, but what I will say is this, um, my surgery in Guadalajara was perfect. Um, mm -hmm. It was perfect. Um, the doctors and the nurses took fantastic care of me. Uh, I, honestly, I, I felt, I don't, I don't know how to say this without sounding rude. In the States, the nurses, they come, you know, every hour or so. I had nurses in the room like every five minutes checking on me. So I always had someone there making sure that I was fine. Um, I can also tell you that um, I had no complications after the fact, no infections. Um, the, the staples were removed within a few days. My scars are minimum. Uh, it, I did not have an uptick in spasms, which I was expecting. Um, but again, I, I, I didn't need pain medication or anything like that. I healed fairly quickly and we were ready by day three to get started with the actual programming of the epidural stimulator. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think speaking of epidural stimulation, so this is the, the most important part, um, um, I let me briefly introduce uh, for the patients the treatment itself. Uh, it's uh, um, for everyone. It's a, a small surgery called laminectomy, uh, where we uh, remove a small component of the posterior vertebral uh, bone from the back um, uh, at around the thoracic uh, T12 L1 level. Um, this contains a, a lumbar spinal cord. This part of the spinal cord is basically responsible for lower body movements, mostly for motor function. And uh, also below this level, there is a network of nerves, which is called sacral motor neurons, which is part of uh, uh, responsibly, uh, partly responsible for autonomic functions. And uh, 
Um, so we stimulate mostly the lumbar uh, spinal cord for lower body function. Um, so the, the treatment involves implantation of small neurostimulator called epidural stimulator into because it's virtually implanted into epidural space. Um, after the implantation is uh, done, um, it is connected with a small, uh, we call it pulse generator, implantable pulse generator. It is a small computer with the battery it generates electrical currents, which are delivered to the spinal cord. Uh, once uh, the spinal cord is electrically stimulated, uh, the corresponding muscle groups, which are directly supplied by this uh, spinal cord segment are able to contract. Uh, so Messi, Messi sorry, went through the similar process where uh, she was uh, seeing the contractions because this is the aim of the treatment. Uh, once we see the contractions, we um, program the stimulator through a process which is called mapping. Mapping is basically we map different muscle groups uh, um, and try to stimulate uh, those groups uh, simultaneously for patients to uh, allow control over their, their limbs. Uh, uh, so during the map mapping process, we, uh, we start uh, with more like major muscle groups, for example, like hip flexors, quadriceps, uh, uh, the bigger groups. And uh, once we see the contractions, we fine tune the settings to allow the patients to control those movements by themselves. So at some point, uh, it becomes volitional, volitional movement, uh, which are controlled by the patients. And uh, once there is a little bit of control, we uh, train uh, the patient for uh, extended period of time. Of course, this is a long uh, ongoing process, which we will talk about later. Uh, but the aim is to find most of the muscle groups are all of the muscle, muscle groups which are responsible for, for working. And uh, at the same time, the, the long-term consistent electrical stimulation of the spinal cord results in um, neuroplasticity, rearrangements of spinal pathways. It results in excitation of uh, autonomic pathways which are responsible for autonomic function, which can over a period of few, few months or few years can regulate the autonomic functions and this can also improve. Uh, I think it's too early to see in Messi's case, uh, but uh, we see over a period of next few months or few years, patients start to see have better and better temperature regulation, cardiovascular function, better circulation, and better immune system also. Um, so uh, Messi, maybe you can tell us uh, uh, about your experience uh, regarding the mapping process. What, uh, what did it feel like initially to basically, uh, you know, uh, feeling the electricity maybe in your muscles or feeling your muscles for the first time after your injury? So the first time they turned it on, um, I don't know if I'm like the only patient that this happens to, but I just laugh. Like a <laughs> I, I, I think it's a tickle program. And then the guys are constantly telling me that maybe we should have one of those so that anytime you're sad, you can just turn it on and you can laugh. But, mm -hmm. um, but the, initially when they turned it on, you can feel, um, for those, I don't know how many quads have sensation in their legs, I still do, but I could feel the electrical current and depending on what electrodes you're turning on, uh, that's not gonna make sense to a lot of you right now, but each electrode controls a part of the lower body. And when you turn that on, um, you can feel, sensations in those particular parts of your body. So for instance, if I, if I'm, I'm looking at the, the gastro part of the foot, right? Um, that, that part of that stimulator will make that part of my foot tangle. That's how you start to get a sense of what they're programming and how you need to interact with the program. Um, I think it took me maybe two days to get my mind wrapped around the process. But once I figured it out, we started to get volitional movement fairly quickly. Um, how you talk to yourself is how your body's gonna move. The stimulator itself doesn't necessarily move you. It, it will move you, it will compel you to make certain movements with your legs, right? Or your feet or your toes, but you have to talk to it. So I think that part of the process, if, you, if you're already really in tune with your body, it's probably not gonna be that foreign to you. But for those of you whose injuries may uh, be a little more attenuated uh, from the stimulator being implanted, I think you're gonna have to really hone in on that and focus 
and try not to get uh, distracted. I'm a person that gets easily distracted. And so I, I'm very happy that I'm in tune with my body. Otherwise it might've taken me a little bit longer. Um, I think we were on day four when I was able to kick my legs and day five where I was fully doing volitional movements and understanding it. So again, the stimulator itself is not what moves you. It's how you talk to the stimulator in respect to it moving through your body. So you really need to focus in on that, understand the sensations where you're having them, and then make your brain want to do those movements too. Uh, I saw somebody say, wow, she's moving really well. Um, it, that, that comes with time, but yeah, that's also being in tune with your body and understanding how it moves. I, my, my core is a lot tighter now. So I have a lot more control over my, over my movements and that, that I, I will say that has been a positive side effect of the stimulator. My trunk control is remarkable. So. Mm -hmm. So what happens basically after a spinal cord injury, there is a partial disruption of the, the, the spinal pathways, which start basically from the brain uh, to control the movements and pass through the spinal cord to the lower body. Uh, so after the disruption, uh, we believe uh, some of the pathways are still intact, although they are non-functional as a result of the trauma. Um, so the, the aim of the epidural stimulation is basically to, to, to wake up those pathways, make those pathways functional, uh, which will allow patients to have control uh, over their movements. Um, but uh, generally speaking, even those pathways, they become functional. Uh, it's not enough uh, because we need a, a huge pool of motor neurons to move bigger muscles. We need to, a lot of neurons to come together and function together to move the muscles. Uh, so the epidural stimulation can also provide more like kind of like missing power. Uh, it can result in stimulation, excitation of the, those motor neuron pools located inside the spinal cord. And then this can result in muscle contractions. And once those pathways become more and more functional, patients start to have better and better control over those movements. Uh, so that's why we normally see more progressive recovery over a period of next few months or few years, because it takes some time for the spinal cord to go through those uh, um, rearrangement, uh, um, uh, you know, rearranging all those pathways and create more and more spinal pathways as it is uh, because it's being forced basically. It's somehow the, because of the electrical stimulation and, you know, patient, patients control the spinal cord is uh, going through this uh, continuous transformative process. And uh, so this is also uh, excellent for the long term recovery. So initially the recovery depends on the stimulator, but uh, in many patients we see more permanent recovery taking place uh, in, in the future where they don't need the stimulator as much as they initially do. Um, and um, also I think uh, Macy, uh, so it's been um, four weeks now since your surgery, um, almost. Almost, um, so yeah, tomorrow. So where are you in terms of your uh, your your progress? So we, what do you do these days? I mean, what is your schedule, for example, for today? What's oh, the plan? My schedule. I work out six out of seven days a week. Um, we get up in the morning. We uh, we map for mm -hmm. two and a half hours. I go straight into therapy. Um, after therapy, I get maybe an hour to an hour and a half break. That's normally when I like eat and like go fix my hair. Um, and then after that, I'm back at mapping for the afternoon. And after that, I actually do hand therapy, which is something that I kind of added. Um, I, I saw someone else had a question. Can she move her fingers? Yes, I can move my fingers. Is that a side effect of this surgery? No. So my nerve transfers are why I can move my fingers. That being said, uh, probably not a discussion to have in this particular venture, but epidural stimulation is offered for the cervical spine. It's just 
it, I think it's, it's something you guys are just starting. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that Cameron is having great success with that right now. So I would go follow him on Instagram and um, check that out. I did not get an epidural stimulator in the cervical. Mine is in the lumbar, I believe. So yeah. She's correct to me. See, yes. yes. Yeah, I think the, the reason is um, not, so first of all, uh, we, so when we decide what kind of treatment is offered to a patient, we look at the, the level of injury and uh, upper body function first. Uh, um, so in your case, uh, we believe you do have reasonable upper body function already, I think as a result of your nerve transplant, where you can actually use your upper body functionally to, to force your lower body to move. So which yeah. is, in our opinion, which is sufficient uh, and we also, uh, we had many patients, and I think this is the most common group of patients we treated, which is C5, C6, incomplete quadriplegia, complete paraplegia. So, uh, so it, it is fine, but for, for those who do not have as much upper body function as you do, uh, we also offer a treatment, as you mentioned, it's this actually the same treatment, but for an upper body function where we uh, implant the stimulator at the, um, it's called cervical plexus, um, it's uh, C, uh, C71. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so this part similarly is responsible for upper body function. It also is quite a large part called cervical enlargement. Uh, so this also contains a lot of motor neurons, uh, which are functionally disconnected from the brain again. So we, we follow the same concept. And actually we also, we had been doing this treatment for a few years already, we treated patients and uh, and so in some cases, we actually do both the stimulators together, uh, like Cameron, who is actually our other patient you mentioned also in Mexico, he received Doing two stimulators. Yeah, I'm just yeah. watching his progress. I'm like, wow, what a superstar. Yes, uh, so uh, he received two stimulators where uh, we are working on both stimulators at the same time. And at some point we will try to turn on both stimulators uh, to stimulate virtually all of the muscles below his level of injury, <clears throat> which will hopefully allow him to, um, to stand and you know, uh, achieve certain, certain functions back. Uh, so this treatment, yes, it can be also offered to a specific group of patients who unfortunately do not have a, you know, a reasonable upper body function, like a C4, C3 patient, for example, or C5 complete patients, where there is a little bit of sometimes shoulder movement, no finger function. Yeah. Oh, but coming back to the schedule, just really quickly, guys, um, it is a lot of work and I am a worker. Like when I say I work, you can ask anyone in my life, if I'm not working, I'm sleeping or raising my kids, whatever it is I'm doing, I'm working. Uh, so I came in here with the mindset to work. Um, I would say it over and over again. And, and I've been, you know, heating questions from all over the world with people asking me about this process. And what I can tell you is if you come here and you do the work, you're going to be successful, but you have to get up in the morning with the mindset that this is a full day. This is not a vacation. This is work. And so the six days out of the seven that you're here, you need to be ready to do the work. You're going to be tired. There's going to be days where you're not going to want to get out of bed and you need to get up and you need to go to work. Sunday, you can rest. You can rest on Sunday. You can sleep in, you can eat all the junk food you want. You can have a nice day by the pool, but you really, you need to come here to do the work. And I believe in this process, the team in Guadalajara has been absolutely amazing to me. They've become like a second family and the people here are so nurturing and loving and caring and supportive that I am, as much as I, I, I was disappointed that I couldn't go to Thailand. Um, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And I, I'm happy that I came here because I've been able to show a different facet of Verita Neuro and a different team and really put out some really good information. And at the same time, you know, we, we meshed really well. And so I think that our progress is partially because of the work that we do, but it's also because of the team that I'm working with. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's simpatico. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, I would, I'd highly encourage everyone to follow what we're doing and consider 
Um, if, it, if, if Thailand is not an option for you, that doesn't mean that Dr. Nasir is not your doctor. He's still your doctor and he's still part of the, part of the process, but COVID times are hard. It's, it's a hard time to, to want to get out in the world and, and trust the process, but I can tell you you're a thousand percent safe here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Missy. Yeah, I think we, I think we have an excellent team in Mexico. I, I'm sure you met a few of our doctors. We have Dr. Mercado, who is the chief yeah. neurosurgeon who performed your surgery. We also have Dr. Rodrigo, Dr. Beatriz, Dr. Paulina, and we have a, a, a team of therapists. I think you're working with four, four people, um, uh, two main therapists, but we also, you may, you may also see other people sometimes being involved also. So yes, and I think we see a very strong correlation between the, uh, the, the, uh, the efforts uh, everyone is putting into the treatment and also the recovery. So uh, the more patients do, the better they get. So, so actually this is a very classical, uh, classical way of spinal cord to recover. You know, when, whenever our spinal cord is being irritated by anything, even if you're doing very extensive physical exercise without anything, there is always some kind of uh, neuroplasticity going on, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, things are happening. So epidural stimulation basically uh, kind of brings this kind of uh, um, uh, recovery process to a next level where, you know, there's a lot of electrical stimulation, there are direct muscle stimulation going on, and then there are other therapies, you know, patients receive. So everything uh, we believe makes a difference, it contributes. And again, the most important part is the patient's commitment uh, towards their recovery, I think it's important for them to understand what is going to happen and what can they expect. Uh, so this is important. And, and I'm glad you are able to figure out very fast by yourself that, you know, how your body is reacting and how, what are your feelings in terms of the, the stimulation going into your different muscle groups. Uh, um, I know that there's questions here and I want to answer them, uh, but I, sure. I can't see them all. I don't know. I think I will be asking. So there are some questions which I think I can answer, but uh, yeah, okay. uh, I them pop up and I'm like, I want to answer your question. I'm so sorry. Okay. Let me read the questions. Uh, what is the name of the doctor? So actually we have uh, uh, not a single person. Uh, we are uh, a, a team. So we have uh, our a team of four doctors in, in Mexico. We have a team of actually um, four doctors in Thailand. We also have in India. Um, so it depends on the location. Um, why the patient didn't get her surgery done in the US? Okay, Messi, I think this is an important question. Why did well, you not get your surgery in the US? Okay, I didn't hear the question. What was it? Uh, why did you not get the surgery in the U.S.? Oh, fantastic. We should ask the FDA. Um, I, I shouldn't say that online. Um, okay, so the reason being is the, they are in clinical trials uh, based out of Louisville, Kentucky right now. It was started by the Department of Defense. It's extremely difficult to get into. There's 100,000 people on the waiting list they're only accepting people under a certain age. And if you don't know someone, you're probably not gonna get in right now. Um, it's not looking to clear until 2025. And that, I mean, that, that might not even be the case at this point. And so when you think about inception of injury, the first two years of your injury are quite critical. So you have to triage, what does that mean for you? So I knew, for instance, that my nerve transfers needed to be done within the first year because your nerves, you know, they start to dwindle away and die. And you have to worry about that. Second thing is that your, your spinal cord, after the first year, you start to see a little bit of healing and start to understand what it's gonna look like. So within that second year, by taking an MRI, you know, Dr. Nasir is able to see what my progress is, the inflammation's going down, what my potential for recovery could be with the stimulator, okay? So if I was to wait until 2025, um, that my, I'm not to say that if you're past two years of injury that you won't recover because there are several people here right now that are doing fairly well and they're outside of the scope of the two years. I, for me, this was a personal decision. For within the first two years, I knew what I wanted to accomplish. This was on my list of things that I wanted to do for myself. 
And I didn't think 2025 was something that I could wait for on a what if. So I chose to come here because the U.S. does not have it open for everyone currently. Uh, I don't agree with that. Okay, I, I wish that we as a, a country could maybe figure this out in, in, in the very near future, but I'm not gonna lie to you guys, it's probably not gonna happen right now. And so epidural stimulation with Veritoneuro uh, is a very real option. Guadalajara or the United States, um, I, I think it's a very real option. I think Thailand is an option too. Uh, if we can get past COVID restrictions and trying to get all of that going, um, but I just I the U.S. is not offering it to everyone right now, and I I hope that that changes soon because it would be very beneficial. Um, I'm not partial to where you go and how you do it. I am just a proponent for knowledge being free and people having the option to choose which right for them without being told that that's not going to be an option for you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I would like to elaborate a little bit more on the duration of injury. Uh, for many patients, it's important to understand our spinal cord goes through um, kind of a, um, a recovery process. It retains some, some potential to recover for up to about two years. So this is the normal consensus among the scientific community. You know, this is where we normally see some kind of recovery taking place within the first two years. So, um, so, so what happens uh, during this period, our spinal cord tries to seal off the injured area. It tries to prevent the spinal cord uh, from getting infected, for example. So there are a lot of Im immune cells going there, um, which are causing uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the astrogliotic scar tissue formation. In simple words, is scar tissue, which, you know, which can be uh, an analogous to what we see over uh, when, when, whenever there is a skin injury. Um, so this scar tissue or, or gli gliosis can prevent the spinal cord from regenerating. So it can, it, sometimes it, over time, it gets harder and harder. It, it becomes more permanent uh, uh, neurological injury after, after some time. So we believe if any treatment is done within the first two years, this can significantly increase the potential of recovery. So we can, uh, with the help of the treatments, we can prevent the scar tissue formation or hopefully we can slow the, the, the process. And then this can keep the recovery window uh, ex for extended period of time. So patients, they can recover more functions if the treatment is provided within first uh, first two years or as soon as patient is uh, recovered from the initial trauma and patient is able to travel, which normally takes three, four months anyway, in most of the patients because of the severe impact. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, sorry, Macy, we also got a question. Uh, do we have to change the battery or the implant over the years? Um, Not right now. Yeah. Yeah, so the implant is uh, is an implantable generator, which is implanted inside the body. So it has two components. One is the electrodes, uh, which are implanted into the epidural space. So it's non-mechanical component. It does not have any moving component. So it can just stay in the body forever. The battery itself is implanted just under the skin. Um, its life expectancy is around nine years. Uh, and uh, it is rechargeable battery. So it can stay in the body for nine years. And after nine years, the it's a matter of uh, uh, recovery. If we see, uh, let's say, a significant recovery after nine years, which we hope will happen in many of the patients, then we may not need a replacement. We can either keep the stimulator in the body, which is not doing anything, or we can simply remove the battery using a small surgery. But if required, we can replace the battery with a, a new stimulator, basically. It's, uh, I think it's less than one hour long procedure just to replace the battery. But it's too early for most of the patients to actually think about what will happen after nine years. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And it's 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 such a minor procedure. Um, it's it's like you're in and out of the OR. It's it's not complicated if it had to be done, if it ever needed to be moved or anything like that. But it's definitely not something that you need to worry about right away. And you don't know what kind of progress you're going to have in those nine years. How often you're going to need the stimulator? Like Dr. Nasser was saying earlier. 
uh, as you progress and get further along, you start to have more volitional movement. And so you can decrease the amount of intensity that you need to use the stimulator. All things that you will learn throughout the process, definitely not something I would worry about right now. Um, I, I see that we have a few, I'm looking, I keep seeing all of these questions pop up. I get so distracted. My ADHD kicks in and I'm like, answer the question, answer the question. I will okay. go to the questions. I okay. think we have, we, have, we have some time, Missy. Um, so the next question I think I can answer is how many leads are on the stimulator? So stimulator is, is it, it's called pedal electrode. So it has small 16 contacts in a single uh, silicon bed. So it's 16 contacts. So we can call it 16 electrode epidural stimulation array. So, um, um, so again, you are doing an amazing messy. Uh, what is the, what, when is it ideal to get the surgery? I think we answered ideally as soon as possible after the initial recovery. Uh, but uh, within first two years, if possible, if not, then of course, uh, you know, it does not make a big difference if it is done after two years or after three years, as long as patients are able to do some level of uh, physical exercise and maintain their muscles. So after around two years, uh, I think the spinal cord kind of uh, becomes more stabilized. It doesn't make a difference, but mm -hmm. uh, there is a spinal cord, sometimes atrophy. And in many patients, there is muscle atrophy. So those are the factors after a long-term recovery, which can determine how likely the patient is uh, to recover, let's say in the next six months or one year. Uh, what if I get sick once I am out of your clinics? Okay, I think this is an important question. Uh, so uh, there are some expected uh, uh, side effects, uh, something uh, which, which has happened in some patients before. Uh, there is a very mm, small risk of infection, which is, a, which is the most severe complication, I would say. Uh, so normally uh, infection can be visible within the hospital stay. And uh, we can actually find, uh, because we, we do pay a lot of attention to the surgical wounds, as I think uh, we, uh, Macy can also maybe confirm, uh, we, we keep uh, an eye on the surgical wound so to find any signs of infection. So if there is any infection, it can be treated normally within the hospital stay with extra antibiotics. In very rare cases, we had to uh, re-suture and clean the, the pocket mm -hmm. where the battery is implanted. Uh, so this can, um, so there are some possible uh, uh, other side effects which can happen. For example, uh, patients can have more spasticity after a few months, which is a normal process of recovery. You know, patients, they, they do uh, see more spasticity as a result of more spinal pathways through the spinal cord, which is a good sign. So this is yeah. not a complication. And if something happens, for example, if there is an initial trauma or if there is, let's say, a technical error within the stimulator, the Medtronic, the stimulator provider, is uh, present in almost 160 countries. So they can normally provide technical support very remotely. They can just go to see the patient and check what is happening. Normally, this does not happen very frequently. It's quite rare. Uh, but then I cannot think of any other scenario. Um, uh, I think if, okay, so in the future, we advise patients to avoid a severe infection or take an infection very seriously. Because in very rare cases, if there is an infection, let's say a urinary tract infection or respiratory infection, it can cause septicemia or bacteremia, where the bacteria can go into the bloodstream and from the blood, it can go to the site of the stimulation, which can potentially result in the infection of the stimulator. So this can happen, let's say after a few years, for example, and then uh, we can see what can we do. Uh, I think it can be treated with antibiotics, for example, or in the um, because I'm looking at the literature, you know, among, among other patients, because the implant looks like, like a cardiac pacemaker, deep brain stimulator, baclofen pump, you know, there are many kind of stimulators, implantable stimulators in the body. So the risks are very similar to uh, other stimulators. It's no extra risk as compared to, you know, others. Uh, um, yeah, so if the, about okay. Uh, if the surgery is not successful, can it take? Can it can it make my condition worse? Um, so first of all, the the stimulator will be always implanted below the level of injury, which is non-functional spinal cord. We will never touch the the healthy part of the spinal cord. 
Uh, so there is no risk of any injury to the upper body function, for example, or any function patient already had. Uh, there may be sometimes spasticity, for example. Uh, so it's very subjective how patients see, you know, if some, because we expect spasticity as a sign of recovery. Uh, so, so, so those are the things which can happen and we of course educate the patients. Uh, but we, we don't see any direct uh, injury as a result of the implantation. Um, so um, did I understand correctly that this treatment can also be done for C5 complete? Uh, yes, it can be done uh, depending upon the upper body function. If there is significant loss of upper body function, um, then it has to be the cervical stimulator first just to, to, to regain some upper body function and then the lumbar stimulator or in some cases we can implant two stimulators together. Um, okay. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, so this is your question, um, Macy. Um, so we are being asked, it was not an easy decision to go get the surgery in Mexico. Did you have any doubts, you know, about the company and uh, what made you trust, uh, trust us? Oh boy. Um, so I, I'm an attorney. Um, I'm currently shooting a documentary. Uh, I'm Miss Wheelchair, Louisiana. I've got a brood of children. Uh, was this an easy decision for me? Absolutely not. Um, would I do it again? In a heartbeat. My children are a thousand percent supportive of my choices. Um, I have wonderful support of my family and my friends. My best friend, Sarah, is back home running the practice like a champ. Um, my godfather is my hero and he's part of the reason why I'm here. Um, I, I feel like your support system is what's going to push you uh, to make these types of decisions. I don't care where you go in the world. Uh, Guadalajara is extremely safe um, and a beautiful place. I'm sure that Thailand, although I've never been, is much the same. I would say that no matter where you go in the world, your support system is what's going to get you through it. So the, the decision was made easy for me because the people in my life that support me told me that this is what you need to do. This is your time and we're going to make sure that everything's okay while you're gone. So I'm able to be here and focus a thousand percent every single day uh, on what's in front of me because I know that the people behind me are supporting me a thousand percent. So I would say that if you know you have the means to be here and you have the support to see you through it, that's what's gonna make this easy for you. Uh, so one question, quick, quick one regarding stem cells, which one is better? Epidural stimulation or stem cells? So the stem cell treatment can uh, improve uh, some uh, uh, sensory components, sensory function can also increase the sensation in bladder pelvic area. But, uh, uh, but we believe uh, for major trauma to the spinal cord, epidural stimulation is a superior treatment, but in many patients, we actually combine the treatments together um, to cover both sensory and motor components. Um, okay, so this is a question about T12 injury. Uh, normally T12 patients, they don't qualify for stimulator, uh, but uh, we, we can actually take a look at the MRI scan to confirm. Um, what if I have some functions, do I lose that functions if uh, I have the implant? Normally we don't, uh, as explained, we don't uh, see any uh, loss of uh, functions. There could be some temporary rearrangement. So there is always a sensory, um, segment a, a dermatome which is between the healthy part of the spinal cord and the the injured spinal cord some patients they have like a, a, a like very vague sensation in some like very superficial very light sensation as a result of the stimulation they feel okay i lost a, a, a sensation in my in my in my little finger for example but this is really not a complication this is how spinal cord uh, recovers or rearranges it it happened in few patients it's nothing we have to worry about you know it's just a, and it comes back i mean normally we see improved sensation over a period of time right but during the transition period patients can go through very minor changes but they don't lose any motor function or, or any movements or any bladder bubble control 
they had before um, before the treatment. Um, do you have office in Canada? We would like a consultation before we travel to Mexico. Uh, we will have uh, we can have on one on one consultation, online consultation. We don't have any office in Canada, um, so it has to be online. Um, so I think uh, we have other questions, Missy. I'm sorry for taking. Oh, just to tie into what Dr. Nasir said. Um, there are no offices in the United States either. He and I um, had uh, Zoom meetings where we would discuss the things that I, I had questions about and was curious and the medical staff was very supportive to that process. So I just thought I would tie on to that. Okay, so we uh, got a question. Can you get the procedure done if you are dealing with um, a bad sore? Uh, if the bad sore is not infected, there is no major infection and um, uh, it can be performed, uh, the procedure. Uh, we just have to see the exact location of the bed sore where it is, whether it is preventing the patient from getting into the equipment we need for walking training. Um, and uh, so one question is T4, incomplete injury. I have some control and uh, sensation. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, even if, if, if there is incomplete injury, um, uh, this can be done, and uh, uh, normally uh, the question is if she, if if I would lose my functions. Uh, we normally we never had anyone who actually lost any motor function, uh, which they had before the procedure. Uh, again, the, the question is about the leads. I have a baclofen pump. Uh, we had treated patients who had baclofen pump before. Uh, we we just have to implant the stimulator on the other side, which we already know what to expect. So this, this is not a problem. We actually have a patient in Guadalajara right now who already had a baclofen pump, Cameron. So he had a baclofen pump, but he also got two more stimulators, one for upper body, one for lower body. So this can be done. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think this is for you, Messi. Uh, I noticed from your videos that you seem to activate the stimulator with your abdominal muscles. Um, I know you said you have to think about the movements, but are physically activating in some way. So I think maybe you can uh, um, elaborate about, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, activating your trunk, uh, uh, trunk muscles and the stimulator. Hi, Franny. I know this person. Hi, Fran. Um, yes, I am activating it in uh, some way. So when we talk about the core movement and how I'm always saying, oh my gosh, my core is so tight. Uh, each patient responds differently in different muscle groups. My two biggest muscle groups that respond to me are my glutes and my core. But I was very active, and as you know, uh, prior to injury. And those two areas were probably my strongest areas. So it did not surprise me one bit when those two kicked in. Um, what I'm feeling is in my lower abdomen and my pelvis, I can feel the sensation of the stimulator and I'm speaking to my pelvis and my core and forcing that portion of my body to either kick that leg out, or pull that leg in. So if you're seeing me laying down, tightening my core, I'm not just tightening it, I'm actually having to visualize mentally which leg I'm going to activate. So there's, I'm sure there is some passive and active going on, some voluntary and involuntary, but most of the movements that you're seeing is me voluntarily engaging my core, voluntarily activating my pelvis and voluntarily kicking that leg out. So those are all movements that you have to think through, push through, and breathe through. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is also about the baclofen pump. Um, so uh, we are being asked if we can actually uh, uh, kind of, uh, what is the word, if you can splice into the existing battery. So I think the question is if we can actually connect two leads uh, into the existing like single Medtronic battery, which can perform both functions. Uh, baclofen pump delivered the baclofen are, and also the stimulator. No, it's not possible. Uh, the hardware and the software does not allow us to do this. It's, uh, it's not designed for performing. The stimulator is not designed for performing more than one function. So it's not possible. We have to implant a completely different system. 
Um, and uh, okay, so I think this may, may see, did you need to bring a caregiver with you to help throughout the process? So I think what is your, what, what are your thoughts on the importance of having a family member with you? Oh, okay. Um, I am not here with family. I am here with a caregiver, same caregiver that I have at home. Um, so my, my daily routine, as far as, you know, morning, bathroom, shower, medication, all of those things. Uh, I depend on her for that. That being said, I also have 24 hour nurse care. I have a nurse with me at all times. If I'm going to the mall, I probably have a nurse. So, um, they check my blood pressure, um, consistently. They check my temperature, my vitals. Uh, they make sure that if there's any assistance needed with transfers, I guarantee you as a quadriplegic, all you're thinking about is how am I going to transfer? Because if you're not doing it already, you're not going to be doing it while you're here. So there's someone to assist you, to get you in and out of bed, to get you into your shower chair, to help get you dressed, whatever. But I, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to bring a person for support, whether it be a caregiver or a family member, uh, I think that it will really benefit you in this process. Um, the next question is about T12 injury. Uh, we said uh, patients normally don't qualify. So what level of injury does a patient normally uh, not qual qualify for the epidural stimulation? Um, so T10 is uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the limit. Uh, some patients with the low lying spinal cord where the spinal cord is terminating at slightly lower level with T11 injuries can also qualify. So we have to actually see on the MRI scan. It's not um, a straightforward rejection. Um, and we do have other options available. There is a treatment which is based around stem cell treatment called lemispine, where we actually perform a similar surgery but instead of implanting the stimulator, we implant the stem cells at a specific location inside the spinal cord. This is called lemispine treatment, which is also our flagship treatment. This can be offered to those patients who are with T12 injury, for example. Um, so I'm T next question is I'm T10 complete. What are the expected outcomes? Uh, of course, it's a very general question. I think we will need to see the, the scans and also the duration of injury, the exact nature of injuries to determine um, how long is the training after the implant? How long would the, the battery, would the stay be? Uh, it's 35 days, um, Macy. Uh, I think you can also, you know, yeah, maybe you can answer uh, the, yeah, the, I'll, I'll the question. And again, I think it's maybe, yeah, the journey, right? What happens in 35 All days? Right. Okay, so uh, my plan was to stay for 35 days. Uh, I was in the hospital for a week, uh, mm -hmm. up to 35 days, but we started mapping on day three. And from the first afternoon that I was at the, the um, outpatient facility, we were at work in the therapy room. Um, mm -hmm. So my day, my, those, you know, seven hour days started in the hospital. And when you get to outpatient, you're doing the exact same thing. Um, you can expect to stay here for at least 30 days. And I would say that if you need to stay longer, you need to be prepared to stay longer. I am not going to be staying longer on this trip. Uh, I do plan on coming back in the next three to six months to um, check on my mapping, to you know, get some more intense physical therapy, uh, these guys are the best, so there's no better place to be. But that being said, you will get to a point where you're going to need to go home and do the work, and then you're going to come back and you're you're going to update those programs. Um, but I would say for your initial visit, you need to expect to stay no less than 30 days if you're really going to get the most out of it. Um, next question. Uh, uh, I think we will try to wrap it up. Um, what did you do to get your body temperature to change after the implant. What did I do to what? To change your body temperature. Oh, what because you I mentioned do? earlier that you feel a little bit warm and more, I think, temperature regulation. So, um, yeah, okay. So, um, when you 
when you have the stimulator, you have 12 programs um, and a little controller. And one of them is called the overnight program. The overnight program is a low intensity sensation that resonates through the spine. And it kind of, it's, it's a little bit of a tangle. You don't keep it too high, but I've noticed that since I've been doing the overnight program that I'm warmer at night. Um, I can tell you that th that's making someone in my life very happy right now. Uh, but the, the other thing that I will say is I noticed that my blood pressure has changed. I used to be in the low nineties, like low 90 over 60. And now my baseline is somewhere around 112 over 68. And that has not happened since before my injury. Uh, I wasn't expecting these two things this quickly. So I don't want to set a, like a false pretense that this is the norm. I do agree with Dr. Nasir that for the most part over time, these things will happen for you. They, things that um, have just happened sooner for me than I think is the status quo. So I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for that, but I don't want to uh, give a false narrative either. You will get there. Uh, these things take time. And once you figure out your body and your programs and when to use them, all of that is gonna help with your body temperature regulation and your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think there are no more questions, uh, uh, yeah. um, do we? There's, um, we have 25 questions in the chat. And uh, I, I can get there. Okay, I you can have. Can I look all the way to the left? Look to the left. You see I can it? see 10 questions. Right there. Oh, um, I, I'm not sure. See? Um, I think we went through. Yeah. Yeah, this is the same. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, we actually, so uh, we have questions. Uh, what was your condition before the surgery? Are you able to walk now? What was my condition before the surgery? Um, no, I could not walk. Um, I did stand in my standing chair and bike uh, indoor and outdoor uh, actively and passively. Um, I was a, a personal trainer prior to injury. So fitness was a big part of my life and it still continues to be. So I would say that that has definitely helped me uh, in this process. Um, but I, I, what I'm doing now, guys, I, I was not doing that before this. And I would say that I'm, I, had, I was just gaining tricep function and now I'm, I'm doing some push-ups unassisted. Like it's insane how your body just responds to this process when you put the work in. Um, but I, I, everything that you're seeing that I'm doing, I was not doing that before I came here. Okay, um, I, I, I don't think that there are any uh, questions I'm missing, but uh, I think uh, um, maybe, is there anything I'm missing, Missy? Can you uh, see? Um, um, I, I can, okay. Did I understand correctly that the treatment can also be done for a C5 complete? I am a C5 complete. Uh, so yes, it can be done for you. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Work as well for incomplete injuries. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I've always kind of functioned as an incomplete, although I'm a diagnosed complete. So I think I'm answering that question twofold. Um, that I think it, it works just as well for both. But if you already have some function, uh, you're only going to get better. Uh, was it an easy decision to do the surgery? We did that one. Do you do stem cells? Which one is better? Uh, you can do both. Uh, there, it, it's, a, it's a bifurcated option. You don't have to choose uh, both. You can choose one or the other. Um, uh, sometimes people choose not to. Um, I was one of those people yeah. on the fence about it. So I, I think that's a personal decision. Uh, but I would say that the stimulator, uh, if you're going to come here to uh, learn how to walk and to stand and to function, the epidural stimulator is an absolute for you. Um, the stimulation is the, the major treatment like Missy you received. So yeah, 
uh, pillow stimulation is the, the main treatment. Uh, the stem cell treatment, some patients do, some they don't, is an option. Uh, we discuss individually uh, with the patients during the call and we discovered that. Uh, can you see any other question, Macy? Yeah, um, Carrie, uh, the hospitalization, you're gonna say seven to 10 days. Uh, then you're gonna transfer to the hotel that has an in therapy facility. You do not have to travel from the hotel to go anywhere, it's all in house. So uh, I do not speak for Thailand when I say that. I'm only speaking for Guadalajara when I say that. It is it's actually different in Thailand. Uh, you can stay inpatient, uh, I believe, throughout the process there. Am, am I incorrect in saying that? Um, you, uh, you mean the hospital, the, uh, the yeah. hospital stay? Mm -hmm. um, it depends, uh, like uh, uh, some, some patients where they need more help um, with the, you know, um, transfer and with, I would say more severe injuries where they need, a, you know, sometimes they need a more respiratory support. For example, uh, sometimes they need a 24 hour nursing services. Uh, uh, you know, there are, so it depends on, it will be an option for, for patients, of course, to, to stay in the hospital for the whole treatment duration. Uh, but uh, most of the patients are stable enough to stay in the hospital for initial period and then focus on their rehabilitation. So this is an optional, uh, uh, this is an option if required, we can discuss individually based, based on patients' individual needs. Um, 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 I, yeah. I don't think that there's any more questions. I think we answered them all. Yeah, I hope so. Um, and. Uh, do you have any message, Macy? Maybe uh, I think just to wrap up our conversation. Anything you would like to say to the um, to the participants? Um, okay, so I I would close out with this: that if you're on the fence, I think you should do it. If you have the energy and the wherewithal and the know-how um, to to get as far as you have already, it, it's definitely worth a shot. And um, I believe that every step that you take forward is an opportunity for you to get better. This is another opportunity for you. There's gonna be a lot of opportunities out there for you and it's up to you to seize them and do something with them. I am so happy that I did this. I'm extremely proud of myself for how I've handled this process. It is not easy to be away from home and the people that you love and push yourself like this. Um, I really wish all of you the best and I hope that you continue to follow this journey and I hope that this works for you. Thank you very much, Missy, for your time. Um, and uh, I think you may receive a lot of questions. I hope uh, um, you don't mind because many patients, they want to follow you on Instagram. So I hope that's fine. Yeah, absolutely, come follow me. It's Macy Lauren, M-A-C-Y-L-A-U-R-E, in, in, in. So you can follow me. Um, I, I post in stories every day. Also in the highlight section, it'll say ES Mexico. That will take you from the first day of my journey all the way to where we are at present. So you can kind of see how it unfolded. Thank you very much, Missy. Thank you everyone for joining us. Okay, right, have a good evening, Missy. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.